listening to The Savvy Musician Show with Leah McHenry, and this is your secret weapon for success in the new music industry. Hey, welcome to the show, everyone. I'm very excited to be talking with Michael Elsner. He is my go-to guy about anything related to licensing, TV, film, ads, anything like that. Michael Elsner is the man. I'm going to let him talk about a little bit of his background and uh, some of the success that he has had in this industry. But I'm telling you, I really like talking to him about this stuff because number one, I've been a huge skeptic of licensing and I never wanted to get into licensing. I've avoided it. I felt like I had no control over it. I felt like I didn't know my way in. And there's all these services out there where you pay fees and supposedly some executive is going to hear it. And I've paid those fees and never heard anything, never got anything back and never heard any good stories about it. So I have purposely avoided that side of the music industry. And Michael has, has completely changed my mind on this. So I'm really excited to introduce you to him today. So welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm excited about this. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I Let's just talk a little bit about your background, some of the successes that you have had in your own personal career, and how did you get into licensing, and why should people consider this as a really valid avenue for their music business? Yeah. Uh, well, the, uh, the the short story is I actually got into licensing completely by accident. Uh, it was never a, a focus that I had um, by any means. You know, I, I grew up in a small town upstate New York, and um, you know, I was, I was a guitar player, uh, still am. Uh, played in a lot of rock bands and and whatnot. And um, in uh, 1998, I journeyed down to Nashville, Tennessee, because it was you know music city. And I thought, well, that's where you got to go, you know, if you're going to have a career in music. And in the late 90s, early 2000s, the, the music scene here was a little different than it is now. I live here now, but, uh, but in between uh, living here in the late 90s and, and currently, I lived in Los Angeles. Uh, after a couple of years of living in Nashville uh, in the early 2000s, uh, you know, country, country music is obviously what, what Nashville is known for. Um, and I never grew up listening to country music at all. Uh, the stuff that I wrote was always very rock and pop oriented. So it just wasn't the right fit for me. Uh, I would always bring my, you know, music into a publisher every, you know, couple months. And uh, they'd always say the same thing, be like, oh, it sounds really good. But, you know, come back in three months and would love to hear what you do. Uh, you know, what else you come up with? So after spinning my wheels for a while, I ended up going out to Los Angeles. And uh, when I got to Los Angeles, it was 2003. <laughs> And I have, I have dogs down here, so they're going to bark every now and then. I'm, I apologize. Uh, <laughs> quick we'll story. It it's all good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my studio is upstairs, but the, but the internet connection can get kind of squirrely with the video chat. So I'm, I'm down here. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, so I went out to Los Angeles and very quickly ended up getting a gig on a TV show. I ended up playing guitar on The Young and the Restless. Uh, and also The Bold and the Beautiful, so two daytime soap operas. And through that process, I was, I was there probably about, you know, six weeks. I didn't know anyone, but I was very focused on, you know, how I was going to meet and break into the music world out there, how I was going to meet people, and, um, and you know, the, the doors opened. So I got that gig, and very quickly I started uh, meeting uh, people who were called music supervisors. I had no idea what that meant. Uh, but I just knew that they worked, you know, putting the music on the show, along with the composer. I've worked with the composer and then these the music supervisors would, would show up. And, uh, and as I became friends with them more and more, I would kind of ask them, you know, so what, what, did, what did they do? And they explained to me what they did. And at the time, a lot of it was, you know, you know, finding songs, you know, if, if they're looking, of course, this is the early 2000s. So, you know, if, if the director really likes an Alanis more set song, <laughs> You know, but they can't spend a hundred thousand dollars on the license for an Alanis Morissette song. Uh, they'll find an independent artist that they can license the same style song for, you know, maybe three or four thousand dollars. And uh, and so I quickly thought, oh well, maybe I should give them some of my music. And uh, and I asked uh, one particular music supervisor if I could give her a CD. And the very next day that I showed up and I saw her, I, I gave her my music. And uh, I think about two or three weeks later, she started licensing some of my songs and it happened that quickly and at that time 
uh, I thought this is amazing. Now I don't have to get a regular job, you know, uh, you know, when I'm not playing guitar on this, on this uh, show, you know, I don't have to worry about getting a job at Starbucks or something like that. Um, but within the first year of living in Los Angeles, first year, year and a half or so, I had my entire songwriting catalog from the four and a half years I was in Nashville placed on TV shows and films out there. So it became just one of those things for me where I was like, this is, this is the easiest thing in the world. <laughs> you know, I can write the songs I want to write and there's always going to be an outlet for it. This is fantastic. So that's kind of how I got into it. And then over the years, as I was, you know, pursuing bands, I was always playing in bands and pursuing the record deal and all that stuff. Um, licensing was always the outlet for the songs. So I, I started a band in the mid 2000s and we were together for four years. The three records, you know, played all the clubs in LA and whatnot. And I always joke that we're the most successful failure of a band. Uh, we never got the record deal. Of course, that was also during the big downturn in the record industry. Uh, we never got a record deal, but we were getting placements like crazy. And uh, so it was a very interesting time to think, my gosh, this is so successful here. And just no doors are opening here. Um, and then after a while of that, it just became clear that, you know, artistically as a musician, uh, you know, when you're doing the band thing, you're focused on one style of music and you're focused on 10 or 12 songs that you work on for a year and you, know, and you try your best to get it out there. Uh, but it became very clear that in the licensing world, I could just write with anyone I wanted to. I could write with a female artist one day, uh, you know, and, and do, do some, you know, to sing or song, right, or Sheryl Crow-ish sounding track. And then the next day I could work with a, you know, like a Latin artist. Um, and then we could get, in fact, I worked with this one particular Latin artist where we got the theme song for the South American Bachelor show. It was called El Soteron. Um, and then the next day I could, I could write, uh, you know, with, with my band and we could do what we wanted to do. And, and when I wasn't working with any of them, I could just write cool instrumental, you know, music that I really liked. And there was always an outlet for it. And I thought, this is... This is actually pretty cool. So that's really the story of how I got into licensing. Uh, and then after a couple years of, uh, you know, I, I was in LA nine years, uh, I just didn't wanna uh, deal with that lifestyle anymore. I ended up moving back to Nashville and set up a studio and uh, continue to really work out of Los Angeles. But, uh, but I live here now. And then one of the things that's nice about licensing is you don't have to live in a music industry town. You can really do it wherever you want. That's really cool. And the thing that really appeals to me in some of the things you shared here was, um, you know, I spent a lot of time building a certain brand for my public music brand. And I spent a lot of time teaching on how to build a music brand. And because, you know, it's, it's so much more than just the music. It's a lifestyle. It's a culture. It's, uh, it's really what people feel when they hear or see your name. And what really appeals to me is that I, as a songwriter, sometimes need to go outside the bounds of that brand. Yeah. And I need creative freedom and I need to go other places. I need to experiment and I need to just, sometimes I don't want to write Celtic metal. I want to write something completely <laughs> different. And so it would, and, and I always teach this, you know, if you're going to do something like that and really get it off the ground, um, it needs to be a separate band or project because if you just start writing all this music under one brand, you're really confusing your audience. Uh, you're going to have a really hard time getting off the ground. But this licensing thing could really be an outlet for that because what appeals to me is that there's a purpose for it. I'm not just writing it because I need to. I can actually do something with it. It's actually useful to someone. It helps tell someone to tell someone's story in a show or whatever. That was such an exciting thought to me that I was like, oh, I have to do this. I have to pursue that. So we'll have to do a follow-up episode later in the year when I've been doing this a little while because I'm only just getting started. And I'd love to report back on the things that I've learned from you and the things that I'm doing with this. So um, I, that just got me so excited. It. Yeah, I'm excited. I mean, I'm excited to hear about that success that you're going to have with it because, you know, the reality is that it doesn't matter what style of music you write. Uh, there's always an outlet for it. That's one thing I've learned through uh, this. In, I've been doing it, I guess, 14 years now. Um, there is always an outlet. And a lot of times, you know, you, you write a track and sometimes you think, ah, yeah, this is kind of not a throwaway piece, but it's definitely not my best work. And oftentimes, <laughs> surprisingly, that becomes the one that does the best for you. You know, you never expected that. I have plenty of stories about that. But the thing that's nice about 
licensing is that, like you said, you know, you don't have to stick with the one brand. And I totally understand, you know, as an artist, you have to brand yourself. You know, diversity is a bad word when you're an artist, uh, you know, as far as pursuing, you know, the, the, the getting your music out there under a brand, you know, but with licensing, you can, you can be as diverse as you want. And the reality is it doesn't matter what style of music you are as an artist. All of us are diverse, creative individuals. You know, I'm a rock guitar player by trade, but I definitely don't just sit and rock and, and, and write rock music all day long, you know? Uh, and say, same with you, you know, you just don't sit and write Celtic metal all day long. You there's, as, as you grow as an artist, you expand and, and you diversify. And, you know, you look at some very successful bands that started doing that and, and, the, and the blowback that they got from their fans. In fact, I think two or three nights ago, uh, Metallica just played here in Nashville. And so I'm, they're on top of my mind right now. But I remember a number of years, probably about 10 years ago or whatever, they started kind of changing some direction and all their fans went, you know, ballistic because they still wanted Metallica to write Master of Puppets. You know, but those guys did that when they were 23, 24 years old. Now they're, you know, in their, you know, mid 40s or late 40s and they got wives and kids and life has changed and they don't, you know, they're not the master of puppets band anymore. You know, so licensing gives you that freedom to grow and expand and explore a lot of different avenues artistically. Yes, that is such a good point. And like I said, it gives me a lot of hope, a lot of excitement over, you know, I, I can write my Celtic metal stuff, but then I can do so much more. I can really explore myself as an artist and it can have a purpose and even bring in some income. Can yeah. we talk for a second about the money and then yeah. talk about your process? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to ask on behalf of a lot of musicians wondering you know, what are some of the dollar ranges that you have seen for certain kinds of placements? And what kind of potential are we talking about? Uh, well, okay, it depends on the style of music that you write um, and your outlets. There's a, I can go, we can go deep into this if you'd like. It'll probably be about like a good five minute conversation in here. But let's start with the types of, of placements that you have, okay? There are really four types of placements. Uh, Really, there's five, okay, if we count theme songs, but those are fairly rare, so we'll set them off to their own special, you know, category over there. But there are four types of placements, okay? Uh, first one is a featured vocal placement. And to give you an example of that, a featured vocal, just uh, imagine that there's a scene where there's a bunch of people driving down the highway in a car. A featured vocal would be this, that particular song on the radio that they're all singing along to, all right? That's featured and it's a vocal performance. Uh, a, then you have what's called a, a featured instrumental, and that's basically the same exact thing. It's just not a, a vocal song. It's an instrumental track. Uh, then you have what's called a background vocal, and that would be this same scene, but the, the characters would be talking you know, and that music would be playing on the radio in, in the background pretty low, you know, so you hear it there and you can decipher, oh yeah, that's a vocal song and I hear the lyrics, but there's dialogue going above it, so it's not featured. Uh, so that'd be considered a background uh, vocal placement because it's in the background, uh, of course, and then you have a background instrumental placement. Now the background instrumental placement will be the most common that you have in general. Like, let's say you're watching a show on HGTV uh, where, you know, it's one of those home improvement shows where they're, you know, always building stuff. Uh, when you watch a show like that, there's music from the very first scene all the way to the end, you know, maybe, you know, 10, 15 snippets of music, and it's all instrumental music. A lot of times, you know, kind of rock oriented or heavy on the drums. It's, it's action oriented, you know, because they're swinging hammers and, you know, carrying uh, granite countertops inside and stuff like that. So that would be uh, a background vocal. Those are the most, I'm sorry, that'd be a background instrumental. That's the most common type of placement. Uh, the majority of your placements will be background vocal or background instrumental. Then you have the, uh, uh, the network, okay? So you basically have like an A and a B level, okay? And if you're on like ABC, NBC, CBS, right, you're on network TV, that would be an A level placement. And then you have basically all the cable stations, you know, HGTV and, you know, uh, True TV and, you know, history and you know all the all the other networks those would be considered like a b level all right so if you get your song on a show on cbs it's going to pay a higher royalty than a show on 
HGTV. Uh, now, keep in mind, there is a, that's, that's a royalty per placement. Um, this, this goes a lot deeper, obviously, because those shows on a lot of those cable networks, they replay often, whereas a show on ABC or NBC or CBS might only re replay twice throughout the year. You know, you get a, a song of yours on, on um, Fixer Upper on HGTV, and it's going to play, you know, 28 times in a month. <laughs> so, so it'll pay lower per uh, performance, but you also have to factor in that they replay those shows a lot more. All right. So you have uh, the type of placement, you have uh, the, the network that's placed on network or cable, and then you have the duration. All right. And uh, I used to know these numbers really well. Uh, I might be off by five seconds or so, but uh, like a one second to 14 second placement, we would say is maybe like a D. Uh, a 15 second to 24 second would be like a D plus. And then uh, 25 seconds to maybe 30 seconds is a, a C. And C. And we, we just kind of keep going up incrementally until you get to two minutes and I think 15 seconds was the last one that I, I recall. Um, and then anything above two minutes and 15 seconds is like an A++, all right? So you have the duration of the, um, of the performance. Of course, obviously, the A++ is going to pay the most. Uh, so you have those. Um, and I, I believe that's it. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, I do have one more. Uh, I knew I was missing one. You have the time of day, okay? So uh, if your song is played between, again, I, I'm not... 100% sure on these numbers, and it'll probably change depending on your PRO, um, ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC here in America. Uh, if, if you have a, sh a song that plays on a TV show from like, you know, uh, one o'clock in the morning to 5.59 in the morning, you know, during the infomercial era uh, time, that would be like a D level, right? And it's going to work its way up incrementally, you know, um, seven in the morning to 9.59 would be uh, up there, and then it just kind of keeps working its way up until it gets to prime time. Okay, and then prime time would be like an A plus plus. So ideally, if you had a featured vocal on network TV, ABC, CBS, or NBC, prime time, you know, it's an eight o'clock show, and it played for over two minutes and fifteen seconds, that is your A plus 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 rating, and with almost 2,200 placements, I've only had that one time. <laughs> so it pays amazing when you get that, but, uh, but that's rare, especially for the duration. You know, very rarely do you have over two minutes and 15 seconds of a song featured on a particular show. Well, that's really important to know because I think there's a lot of musicians thinking that's how it works all the time. So um, have you seen other artists do this? For example, you don't need to share like your income, but what have you seen out like in other people, if they get a placement like that, what are the type of ranges? Like, I think if we can put something concrete. Sure. Well, I mean, I can tell you what, 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 a, what, a, what a royalty would be on that. Uh, on, on my particular royalty on that um, was around, every performance was around $2,100. That wasn't the upfront fee. The upfront fee is separately negotiated separately. The upfront fee is just like the process of buying a house, all right? Uh, if you've ever bought a house, you know, there's a little bit of a back and forth between, you know, I want to pay this much for the house. No, we want, we want you to pay this much. And you do a little back and forth until you come up with a number. Um, there is really no set fee as far as an upfront uh, licensing fee. Uh, I can give you some examples of some that were uh, astronomically high and, and fascinating. Um, but that's really a, kind of an open-ended situation because it depends on the show. It depends on the use. It depends on the budget, you know? Um, yeah, so it, it could depend on how unique your song is. You know, if they're just looking for a female rock song, uh, you know, and, and, and you want, you know, 6,000 and they're offering 2,000, they can always just go find another female rock song. But if they're looking for a female rock song uh, sung in Chinese, in three, four at this particular tempo, and you specifically happen to have that, that becomes a whole different negotiating uh, weight. You know, uh, you can probably ask for a lot more because there's not going to be a lot of those songs out there. Um, it's more unique, obviously. Uh, but uh, I'll tell you a funny story. I have a friend of mine who licenses music, um, and he's actually the one who's in charge of, of securing the licenses. And uh, we were having dinner and I asked him, what's the most you ever paid for a, a license? And he said, $1.8 million. <laughs> and uh, Jackpot. Yeah, no kidding, right? Well, this story gets really funny. Uh, it was a Beatles song. 
But uh, there's a very specific clause uh, that happens in licensing uh, contracts. Not all, but uh, if, if you have it in your contract, then it's fantastic. It's called most favored nations, all right? And what that clause means is that uh, you have two sides to a contract. Anytime you sign a, a song for, uh, that's gonna be synced to picture, right? Uh, there are two contracts. You have a sync license and a master license. So every single time you hear a song on TV, every single time, two licenses had to be signed for that, all right? The sync and the master. It's important to keep that in mind. Um, the master license is signed by whoever paid for the recording. I just gave this example recently, so I'll, I'll give it again. Um, as I was explaining it to someone so they understood. Uh, Bob Dylan, great songwriter, right? Uh, he has a song called Knocking on Heaven's Door. That was also recorded back in the late 80s by um, Guns N' Roses. And it's been recorded by probably hundreds of other artists, but we'll just use the Guns N' Roses example. Uh, Guns N' Roses has their version of, of, of Knocking on Heaven's Door. Well, they didn't write it, but their record label paid for that recording. Their, Geffer, their record label is called Geffen Records. So their record label paid for that recording. Therefore, Geffen Records owns that master recording. So if someone wanted to license Guns N' Roses version of Knocking on Heaven's Door, they would have to reach out to Geffen Records or whoever's in control of Geffen Records now for the license to, to license the master, all right? Then they would have to reach out to Bob Dylan's publisher uh, because the other license is called the sync license and the sync license is, is uh, basically it's, it's uh, signed by the publisher. It's signed by whoever controls the copyright of the song. All right. So for the sync license, they'd reach out to Bob Dylan's publisher. They would agree to a certain term. Geffen Records would, uh, certain price, I'm sorry. Geffen Records would agree to a certain price. And what most favored nations means is that the higher of the two, both of them get. So for example, if Bob Dylan's publisher says we want $80,000 for it and not a penny less, and Geffen Records says we're happy with $50,000, then in order to license that song, it would be 80 and 80. So it'd be $120,000. And that's what the most favored nations clause means. It means that one person can't get more than another. Okay. That being said, uh, a friend of mine had to license um, a, a, a Beatles song. And I forgot which one it was. It may have been like Strawberry Fields Forever. It was, a, it was a very popular song that we've all heard a zillion times. And he called Apple Records. Apple Records is their record label. They own the master. Uh, and they agreed to like $30,000. And then he reached out to EMI Publishing. And EMI owns, you know, Paul McCartney and John uh, Lennon's uh, publishing, or maybe it was like Sony ATV or whoever it was, whoever controlled the, the publishing. I think it was EMI, doesn't matter. Uh, and, um, and they wouldn't take a penny less than $900,000, which means that this $30,000 suddenly becomes $900,000. That's 1.8 million. So what he did is he called the director and the producer and he said, this is going to cost $1.8 million. And the you know, whoever it was, whoever was in charge, the director, the producer said, yeah, that's, that's the song I want for the scene. So he said, I called back Apple and I said, you know, you just made another $870,000. So. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is wow. crazy. So does it help if you are the one that owns everything, you're the publisher and you own all the rights? Does that help in this situation? Yeah. And that, that's a fantastic question. That's what's known as a one-stop shop. All right. Uh, and a one-stop shop means that if you own, you know, you paid for your recording and you own your publishing and I wanted to license your music, I just have to go to you, you know, granted, we still have to have both contracts signed, but we can, you know, morph them into one and I can just shoot you over a little email PDF and you can sign it and scan it and send it back. And that contract can be handled in two minutes. So one-stop shops are ideal. And a one-stop shop is actually, um, really what music libraries are now. And music libraries have become very popular, uh, you know, in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, and that's the reason why. Uh, it's because a music library can go to the, I'm sorry, a music supervisor or a music editor or whoever's licensing the music can go to that particular music library that's controlling and administering that particular song. And they can get 
both the master and the sync taken care of. And like I said, in one simple email. Uh, and that's why music libraries are very popular. So they basically effectively become one-stop shops. And as an artist, let's say, you know, you are the artist and you sign your music over to a library, you're basically giving them the rights to administer your songs. You're not giving them ownership of your music. Okay, that's something to remember. A lot of people get very confused about this. You're not giving ownership away. In fact, legally, you can. Uh, when you create a song, it, it's your song, right? You own that copyright. Uh, and it's really forever yours, unless it's a work for hire and so we can get kind of crazy with other types of contracts, but that's your intellectual property. So when you let someone else control it, like a publisher or a music library or some music catalog, you're not giving up the rights to your song, okay? Um, now granted, for them to administer it, they're gonna take a portion of it, right? They need to get paid, they need to pay their employers, their employees, they have to have a reason to work your song. Um, but yeah, so most music libraries, uh, are one-stop shops. Okay. Um, I have a couple of questions about that, that I think okay. will really help. Uh, before we do that, if we go back to the dollar ranges that okay. you've seen, we talked about some of like the big ones and like, I mean, they could pay really anything that they want according to their budget. And if you just happen to have that special song that, that nobody else has, I mean, you have a lot of negotiating power, so that's cool. So you're, you're often seeing an upfront fee and then the royalties, and depending on what kind of station it is, if it's TV or film or whatever it is, uh, there's, there's a huge range. Now, what, what about for like some of the smaller potatoes kind of a thing? Like what, what's really common? Um, on, and I know there's so many scenarios, so it's hard to nail this down, but yeah. I, I want to paint a picture of the potential income streams that this could provide okay. for musicians thinking about it. Yeah, so the potential income stream, uh, I have a friend of mine who says that, that if he makes less than seven figures a year with his licenses, he's had a bad year. Now, he, he works hard. I've never reached that level. Uh, I've always hovered around the, and again, it just depends. Some years are good. Some years are bad. It's, it's not bad. I shouldn't say bad, but some years aren't as, as good as others. But I've hovered in the, in the high fives and low sixes. And that fluctuates, and it's just going to naturally because of the types of placements. You know, uh, some years you get really good high dollar ones, and some years, you know, you just don't get as many good high dollar ones. Uh, and high dollar is, is key. And we can talk about this. Probably this might lead well into your um, question about libraries uh, because we can talk about high dollar libraries and low dollar libraries and I'm very opinionated when it comes to this. Um, but that being said, uh, I'll just give you some examples. You can have, you can have, uh, you know, let's say you have a 10 second placement on a, on a, on a, on a show, you know, that might pay you 50 bucks. Yeah. I, I don't know because it's, if that if that show airs once, you know maybe fifty bucks. If it airs, you know five times, maybe two hundred two hundred and fifty dollars. It's it's really hard to predict. Um, I kind of always look at the royalty side as being more like Christmas. You know, uh, when you get your royalty statement, you kind of open it up and you're like, oh, this is you know. I, I kind of refer back to when I was seven years old and I opened up a present back in 1982 and it was a Millennium Falcon. You know, this was the coolest thing. I wasn't expecting to get a Millennium Falcon. That's kind of what it is sometimes. You know, sometimes you open up your statements and you're heavily surprised. Other times it's exactly what you expect. As far as the upfront fees, they can vary. Uh, I've had upfront fees that are as high as into the 80s, but those have been for trailers and commercials. And then I've had upfront fees that are, I mean, literally like, you know, 50 bucks. Um, so my focus, uh, I might be able to answer this a little easier if, if I kind of tell you where I come from and my perspective of licensing. My focus is never about the one license. You know, uh, I'm happy to forego a upfront fee if it's on a great, if it's a great placement on a great show that I know that the back end will be good. Okay. I obviously would never give up an upfront fee on an infomercial because I wouldn't make a penny on the infomercial, right? Something that plays at three in the morning. But I'm happy to give up, you know, a three or four hundred dollar upfront license fee, which I think is pretty low, um, if it's going to be on a good show and it's going to have multiple, um, you know, they're going to play it multiple times. At the same point, if it's a show that could be popular in other countries, uh, because if it plays now, that's awesome. But that episode will then start playing in another country in another two or three years, and you got to factor in the long term. So my whole approach to licensing 
is not about the one song. I'm about consistent placements. You know, uh, I've, I've at, been averaging around 200 a year for the last number of years. Uh, and that to me is more the goal as opposed to, I just want that one big placement. The one big placement's nice, but it's the consistency that is what uh, is going to allow you to build um, an actual career out of it. And by consistent, I don't necessarily mean that you have to constantly write new material and, you know, each song gets one placement. No, you can, yeah, I, I use this example a lot. I, I did a four song EP with a, with a country artist, a female country artist. And the last time I checked, which was a couple months ago, uh, we had 52 placements off of those four songs. And one of them had either 32 or 36 placements. I, I forget at the moment, 14 of which were on The Voice over two seasons. Now, The Voice is a prime time network TV show. And this is obvious, these are obviously vocal songs. It was like a you know, pop country record. So four songs, uh, 52 or 50 plus placements. That, that, that girl's had a fantastic run with a four song EP. Dang, that's really good. Yeah. Yeah. So the point with that is really looking at it over the long term. This one song, if you have a song, say, that's this long, you know, and let's say just for simple math, you're going to get 15 second placements, you know, and let's say it's, you know, three minutes long. Um, you know, maybe, maybe one show, maybe the editor on one show is going to use these 15 seconds. And then maybe an editor on another show is going to use these 15 seconds. And maybe another editor is going to use these 15 seconds. And maybe here, and you can see what I'm saying? So, so this song is this long, but you're getting really dozens of placements on these little clips that are all these different sections of a song. It doesn't matter if they use the chorus or the verse or the intro or the bridge or whatever, because you're still getting the same royalty. You're still getting the license. You're still getting the 15 second placement. You know, and again, that's going to just change depending on the type of show and, you know, how often it gets played. So that to me is more important than focusing in on this song is going to make me $1,200 on the license fee. That's cool. Uh, but I think that that's actually the wrong focus. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And thank you for sharing all that. I think that really sheds some light. And uh, I mean, I think it's it's motivating too to know that you know, you've got, you've got some control in this situation, you've got some leverage, and there's a ton of opportunity out there. So, yeah, you, I mean, you know, you, you don't have to worry about, uh, you don't have to worry about, I know a lot of artists don't, you know, like, I, don't, I don't want my music being used in like, you know, an adult film or things like this. And, and that, you have control over that, you know, you don't have to worry about, you know, this, this will get more into detail, I think, as we start talking about libraries, but uh, and who you're working with supervisors and whatnot, but you don't have to worry about the misuse of your music. You know, uh, you, as an artist, and I know that's very important to a lot of artists, you know, and, and you can have control over that. Yes, that is fantastic. Um, okay, libraries. Uh, yeah. When you say that, when, you know, my beginner ears are like, okay, are you talking about taxi? Are you talking about some of these services where you pay a fee and you upload it and then some mysterious elves and behind the scene are pitching my song somewhere and then I never hear back and then I wasted my money? Let's, let's clear this up. What is a real legit library from some of these services out there and uh, what's your whole take on that? Okay, so there are four types of libraries. You know, by now you should probably have a pen and start writing all my numbers down, right? There are four types of libraries. Uh, the first is called uh, an exclusive library. Uh, the second, it would be a non-exclusive library. Um, I'm sorry, there are three types of libraries, sorry. And the third is, is a royalty-free music libraries. I should have said there are four outlets to your music. The, the first one is direct to music supervisors and editors. And then you have um, exclusive library, non-exclusive library, and royalty-free music libraries. Uh, now, if we're just gonna talk about music libraries, uh, this gets really interesting. A lot of musicians have a fear, again, of, of giving up the rights to their music. And it's totally understandable. So for a lot of them, um, when they walk down the music library route, they're drawn to the idea of a non-exclusive music library. Now, if you're not familiar with what this means, um, what it simply means is that uh, they're also known as retitling companies. What that means is that, let's say I have a, um, I have a song called Cell Phone, I'm trying to find another, okay, and I have a cup here, so I'm going to, 
I'm gonna pull out my little, my little smoothie, all right? I have a song called uh, Blueberry Smoothie. <laughs> And that's my song. I wrote it. I'm so happy with it. Oh, I love it. It's going to go on my record and I'm going to sell it. Um, but I also have the opportunity to work with a non-exclusive library. So I'm going to give them my song, Blueberry Smoothie, but they're going to retitle it iPhone. All right. That means that when they're out pitching the song, it's the exact same piece of music, the exact same piece of audio, they're pitching a song called iPhone. It also means that they become, because they're now the representative of that song, they're administering that song, they own the copyright, or they, they're currently controlling the copyright, I should say. They're controlling the copyright of iPhone. This gives you, the musician, the freedom to think, well, I still own Blueberry Smoothie, right? Here's the problem. If, if you just do it like this, that's okay, right? Because you're not going to be actively pitching your song. But... If you work with company A, they have this song out there called iPhone, and then you give it to another company, and um, I don't know, we'll just call it wallet. <laughs> I don't have my wallet with me, but um, imagine this is a wallet. Uh, you now have company B holding a, a wallet, <laughs> pitching your song called wallet. iPhone, wallet. This company gets it placed. They get the song wallet placed. Well, now we have the technology you know, that Shazam technology that can listen, you know, and it can tell what song it is. This is where exclusives can become um, uh, an absolute mess. Your PRO, ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC here in America, here's that song, it's Wallet, it's called Wallet, it's company B license, you know, they got the license. But that company, your PRO, is tracing it to the song iPhone. So what's gonna happen is that you, as the songwriter, you're still gonna get paid your portion of the songwriting. So yeah, you, it doesn't matter, you're happy. But this company is getting paid for something that they didn't do. And this company is gonna start chasing down that money that they want. And who's in the middle? You. So uh, I, I have, I've heard some um, <laughs> pretty gnarly stories of friends of mine who've gotten into the into the middle of this and um, I, I kind of got into one of these uh, in, a, in a roundabout way um, and it got pretty bad uh, and it, it, it's a very quick way to destroy your reputation uh, because you have too many companies pitching the same song now at the same point that being said exclusives non exclusives I'm sorry generally don't have the same high dollar value as, as exclusives. Non-exclusives generally are the companies that you log into, you know, you go to their website, it's like sign up. And you, so you sign up and you create a password and then it's like, well, upload your music. So you upload your music and then, you know, thank you. And now it's in their catalog. I feel that those companies are complete garbage. Um, and it's not only me, uh, I've been doing it long enough and I know enough people in the industry that, that they're really garbage. Uh, they're basically music collection agencies. There's no, um, there's really no quality control. In fact, I'd encourage you, if you're interested in looking at some particular companies like this, before you sign up, just go scroll through and listen to the music in their catalog. Some of it's really, really, really bad. And uh, that should be evidence enough to why a lot of higher level supervisors and editors and TV shows and productions won't be pulling music from those companies. Um, oh, that's so good to know. And I thank you for your honesty on this yeah. because people like me who, you know, years ago when I, I decided I really want to pursue my music, I was looking at these companies and I was actually submitting things there. And then, and then I never heard back and I, it really produced a skepticism in me and a cynicism in me that number one, stay far away from licensing. This yeah. just seems like, you know, sketchy all around. It can be predatory. Uh, I feel, uh, Taking it another step further, um, there are things called blanket licenses, uh, and that's when basically a, a production company has, let's say, like $60,000 for all of the music for an entire season, and they, they partner with this particular company. Uh, they pay them $60,000 for the rights to license anything uh, in their catalog for that entire season, and sometimes those seasons could be, you know, like 20 episodes and whatnot. Uh, if you look very closely, and I, I've, I've read a lot of these contracts, I, I, my friends send them to me all the time, and people, you know, just, I'm, I'm 
pretty quick at reading contracts and I've done it enough. So I, I read my friend's contracts and I read them and uh, a lot of them have, um, you know, uh, paragraphs where they state very specifically, uh, you know, we'll uh, upfront fees or split 50-50. That always sounds so exciting, except for blanket licenses. And the majority of that company's business comes from blanket licenses. So you as the artist putting music into that catalog, you're expecting to get your 50-50 split on the upfronts, but when their business model is based around blanket licenses, you're not gonna make any. On top of it, the placements are gonna be the lower dollar ones because you're talking about a non-exclusive or these companies where they might you know, make those deals for $60,000 for the entire season on a, on a low dollar production, whereas high dollar productions, you know, their budgets for every episode is 80 to a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. So you, it's, it's a big difference. Um, so I really encourage people to go the exclusive route. The non-exclusive route, frankly, is just the simplest route to go for people who don't want to put in the time to actually research and learn the process of licensing their music. And it's not a hard process at all. Um, I really think it's the lazy man's way out. And, uh, and the reality is you'll never make a living doing it. Okay. That's great. Now tell us about what, a, what is a quality library and how does it work? And, and if you sign on to a quality library, can you, can you be on multiple libraries or just one? Oh yeah. And then, and then what is a, if it's like an exclusive thing and, oh, and then tell me about after libraries about like pitching agencies. Is that the same thing or something different? A pitching agency. Yeah, I've heard of like agencies where where it's like a it's it's like a library, but they're like working to pitch your songs for you for oh, and then nice. splitting the costs. Have you heard of that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're based they're basically like administrators. Yeah, I mean, they're basically acting as a library. Um, but um, so let, let's let's go back a couple steps. Uh, the exclusive deal. Uh, so just so you understand. Uh, when, when you sign something over exclusively to a library, they will take your publishing. Now you can, again, everything's in negotiation. Uh, there's really not a big difference between music licensing and the process of buying a house. The whole thing is in negotiation. Nothing is set in stone. So if you're working with a company, let's say you're bringing them some high quality songs, you know, you could definitely negotiate for a portion of the publishing to come back to you. Absolutely. You know, everything's negotiable. Um, but again, a lot of musicians are very fearful of this because they have the belief that I, I don't want to, you know, get, I don't want to, you know, give away my music or I don't want, you know, to give someone else my songs and stuff like that. This comes back to just understanding the basics of publishing. Uh, and so I would start with the very first thing, anytime you read any contract, always 100% of the time, make sure that you can find, there's always a paragraph that says term and there should be, if there's not, throw it away. Uh, there should be a paragraph that says term. Uh, this is gonna be the term of your contract. And this is where you're gonna see what's called the reversion clause. And a reversion clause is simply a statement in the contract that says that after say like three years, uh, there's a window that will open up, you know, for you to send them an, uh, a letter in the mail, um, that states that, you know, you'd like to pull their music from their catalog. You may have like a three month window and this and that. If you don't, uh, you know, send that, you know, by certified mail during that time, then the, then the contract will continue for like another two years and stuff like that, uh, which is fair. Uh, but it's giving the library reason and security to, to actually put your songs into their catalog and send it out to all their sub publishers throughout the world and really work that catalog without fear that you're suddenly going to just, you know, tomorrow decide to pull your music out, you know? Um, so it gives them incentive to work your catalog. You have to give people incentive to work your music. If you want to make money at it, you have to give them incentive to, to, to do that. And the way to give them incentive is really uh, by letting them control the publishing. Uh, also by letting them control the publishing, that's, that's, they're taking on all the administrative roles of working your music, right? So that's what an exclusive music deal is. Um, uh, I think three years is, is fair. I think five years would be a little high. Uh, one year, in my opinion, is not even close to enough. Um, simply because you have to think of all the sub-publishers because we have to get out of the mindset of just America. There are all these other countries <laughs> on, on the earth that use music 
And all of these publishers, a reputable company, will have sub-publishers all throughout the world. And as they add new songs into their catalog, it takes some time, like anything. It might take, you know, four or five or six months for their other sub-publishers to all get those songs to and start working those songs. So, you know, aside from just the American TV shows, there are shows all over the world that will be licensing your music as well. Um, that so makes a lot of sense. Yeah, again, it's, you gotta think the long term here, okay? Um, and the fear of the exclusive deal can be completely relieved by simply having a term and a reversion con, uh, clause in your contract. Um, uh, then at that point, the nice thing about, about that is that you have a company where they have an entire staff where every day those, those staff members are constantly working songs. They're constantly, you know, in contact with different productions and supervisors and editors and finding out what someone needs and then going through their catalog and getting it out. And, um, you know, that's where at that point, the most important aspect of successfully licensing your music is being able to be in control yourself of your metadata. Now, I know a lot of musicians just typically, they wanna write their music and they wanna throw their hands in the air and just you know send it out and let someone else deal with it. I, I deal with these questions all the time and then they wonder why uh, you know, they haven't had success with it. No, it's because they really forgot a number of very key steps between finishing their song and then delivering their song to the end user, to their music library. Uh, and, uh, and two of those steps are, I, I have a four step process that I take every song through, but two of those steps are, the second step in the process is what I call creating valuable content. And that's where you can create all your alternate mixes. Uh, that's where you burn out your stem mixes. These are so important. Uh, it's where you can create your cut down mixes, your 30, your 60 second, and your 15 second cut down mixes. These are ideal for commercials. This is, this is where you add immense value. You can take one song in your catalog. Let's say you have, uh, let's just say you do a 10 song record, right? So for every song in your catalog, let's say, for example, you can create five alternate mixes or cut down mixes, and we can get into these in detail if you'd like. Um, if you can do five or six for each song on your record, you're now able to deliver 60 to 70 licensable pieces of material, licensable tracks to the library, which will then be sending that out to all their, you know, uh, sub publishers around the world. That's key. That just opens you up to all these other placements. The third step in my process is what I call mastering metadata. And I would never leave this to someone else. I would never leave this to someone at the library. Heck, you never know. It could be just the intern on a Friday who's just trying to get through the metadata really quickly so they can go out on a date with you know, their boyfriend or girlfriend. You don't want to leave your success in the hands of that person, okay? Because the metadata is the information that's attached to your music that allows it to be searched by all these people throughout the world to find the right song for the right scene. If they're looking at at 100,000 songs in that catalog, that's where they're starting. And they're typing in these keywords to match various elements of the scene or moods and emotions. You want your song to be at the bottom of that funnel. You want to be you know, the, the five or six songs that they're gonna audition for that scene, right? So those two steps are absolutely essential. Those are two steps that in the music industry don't exist, but when you're in the licensing world, you're working in the TV industry, okay? So your end users use your music in a different way. So those two steps, very simple. Uh, you can take your song through those, you know, in 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes. Uh, so it doesn't take a lot of time and they're very simple, but they're essential to getting the placement um, down the road. Oh man, this is just such an eye-opening uh, episode here, just going through all the different sources of information and, and, and just so many, I mean, there's steps and there's just so many ins and outs of this whole thing. Oh man, this has been so eye-opening and I hope anybody listening right now is, I'm sure your mind is blown. If you've never gotten into licensing, you can probably hear that there's a lot of potential. And um, I wanna, we're gonna dig into a little more about uh, Michael's process in the way he licenses his music. And one thing I really appreciate about, appreciate about him is his methodical 
method, I guess that's the same word, redundant, methodical <laughs> method, um, uh, and the way he breaks it down. So we'll see you in the next episode, and we're going to talk about his four-step process. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. And I have some exciting news for you. If you have been wanting to know how you can crack the code of Spotify and increase your listeners and your monthly followers so that you can create a regular stream of income, this is going to be so exciting. Join the wait list and be the first to know when our new Spotify mini course is live. Go to SavvyMusicianAcademy.com forward slash Spotify. That's SavvyMusicianAcademy.com forward slash Spotify and sign up for the wait list and we will email you as soon as that mini course is live. This is going to be so exciting. I'm very proud to present this to you. This is unlike any other teaching out there and I promise it's going to be worth it. Thanks again for listening today and we'll see you soon.